Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. This is video number 17 in my series, Astrophotography Target Tips. And in this video, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite fall targets, and that is the Flaming Star Nebula. I have a short list of things uh, that make a target, you know, one of my favorites and a great one to image. First of all, of course, it has to be beautiful, which most of these targets are, let's be honest. But I loved a, any target, any uh, particular nebula that has a lot of detail in it and, you know, stuff that you can pull out without having to sink a ton of time into. And another thing that really helps with that is the second point is a bright target. This is a magnitude six. So we're talking up there with North America and a lot of those other bright summer emission nebula. So that's always a good thing. And the third one, especially if you're not using a go-to mount, easy to find. And this one is pretty darn easy to find. So let's talk all about that. First of all, a little bit about the Flaming Star Nebula. As we mentioned, it's an emission nebula. It's magnitude six, so it's quite bright. And it's a fairly large one. I mean, it's probably not quite as big as the California or something like that, but it's easily found and you know you can image it with a quite a wide field uh, setup you could go anywhere from the red cat 51 that's 250 millimeters up to probably i don't know over 100 millimeters of focal length in my case i used my sharp star 76 millimeter and i paired it with the asi 533 mc pro camera now that has a nice square sensor we've talked about that in this particular video comparing the 533 to the 294 and I wasn't sure, I was originally going to use the 294, but it was already on another scope and I was being lazy. So I said, oh, let's try it with the 533, that square sensor. And it ended up being just perfect. Um, I really didn't have to crop it a lot. It got nice and zoomed in. It still fit with enough room to be able to do a slight crop, especially when it comes to, as we always talk about, multi-night imaging. There's always some sort of weird stacking line when you combine all the data. So being able to just do a, a minor crop and get right in on those beautiful details I was really happy that I ended up going with that. Now I have shot this target before. Here's my image. This was last fall. I shot it with my, of course, my DSLR back then, my modified Canon and the same telescope, I believe, my Sharp Star. So you can see it's a little more wide field. You'll be able to compare this to the final image. You'll see eventually anyway. And I definitely got the whole sort of smoky, almost like a trail of smoke. I always think of it as at the top of this target. And even a lot more. And I, I think I even in on this image, I did crop it a good amount. So um, I am definitely prefer the more cropped version. As you'll see at the end of this video, you just see a little bit more detail. And you're able to, in my opinion, do this target a little bit more justice. But it's still beautiful, even in wide field, like my first image. Wasn't crazy happy with it. I mean, at the time I was. Now I look back and it's not very good. Very noisy. Also, I had some real problems with, I think it must have been dust on my sensor of my DSLR and I had to work hard to cover it. And if you look closely, I didn't do that great a job. So there was definitely room for improvement. And hopefully you guys agree that I did improve on that particular image with the newest one. So let's talk about where to locate the Flaming Star Nebula. Now it's located in the constellation Auriga. Now Auriga is nice because it's big, it's easy to identify, and it's got one really bright star in it, Capella. As you can see in this image, thanks to Solarium, the top left star is called Capella. It's very bright and very easy to see, even in the worst of light pollution, like where I am here in Toronto. So once you find Capella in the eastern sky, you can sort of start to sort of trace out that trapezoidal shape of the rest of the constellation. And for this particular target, we're going to be focusing on the right side. So if you find Capella, go to the right side now of Auriga. There are two stars, one above the other fairly separated, maybe three, four finger lengths when you're holding your hand out in front of you. And we're going to be focusing in between those two stars and just off to the left. So we're going towards the middle of Auriga, not all the way, just a little bit inside of those two stars. That's where you'll find the flaming star nebula. Now, what's nice about it is that there's another nebula just below it. And that one's called the tadpoles nebula. So stay tuned. That one as a hint is coming soon. But what's nice about when you have two targets so close to each other is that oftentimes your first sort of t a couple of test exposures where you're trying to find it, this is of course assuming you're not using a go-to mount. Like in my case here, I was using my Star Adventurer. So we're relying on just a laser pointer and an app like Stellarium to help find it. But the nice thing is if you're a little bit too low, then you're likely gonna run into the Tadpole Nebula. In fact, they're so close that many guys will actually shoot the two of them together with their 
you know, a more wide field setup, say like the Red Cat or even maybe um, a camera lens, you know, maybe a 135 camera lens, and they can get both of those targets in, in the same shot. But them being so close, it really does help because oftentimes uh, you're going to be a little bit too low. And then you'll know as soon as you see that tadpole nebula, you're not recognizing the flaming star, you probably went a little bit too low and then you can make adjustments and raise it up. Also, there's a sort of band of bright stars that go in between the two targets. So more than likely, if you're not that far off, at least being too low, you're going to see those band of stars and you can, again, raise it up. So my advice to you was if you're trying to find this for the first time, aim a little bit low, aim about halfway through those stars and off to the left. And more than likely, you'll find that either the tadpole or those band of bright stars, and then you can make adjustments accordingly. Now, when it comes to framing it up, um, if you are using wide field, you'll have a lot of room. Just keep in mind that if you want to get that sort of trail of smoke, as you can see in the image here, it is quite long and it's quite large. So make sure you have room at the top of your framing and uh, to the right. So assuming that your flaming star is on the left-hand side, towards the left-hand side of your um, display screen, if you're using a, a Canon or on your tablet, make sure that you give yourself enough room uh, to do that. As I mentioned, even with my 533 and that square sensor, I still had enough room to fit it in. It was sort of on an angle, okay? So the 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 smoke, we could call it coming off, was actually pointing down, and the flaming star was sort of on an angle, but it, it actually fit perfectly in my square sensor. But if you're using something more wide field, you're gonna have more than enough room. So don't worry too much about it, but just may, take the time to make sure you got it just right so you're not cutting anything out. So let's talk about integration time. Now in this particular case, I got uh, seven and a half hours of integration time. I believe on my first image, I'd have to check. It was somewhere around five. Um, that picture maybe doesn't do it justice for five hours for what I'm about to say, but uh, you really don't need a ton of integration time if you're getting nice quality data. I would say three to five hours is more than enough. As I mentioned, it's a pretty bright target. And there's a lot of detail that comes through fairly easily. So it's not one of these ones that you really need to stretch and stretch just to try and pull out detail. It's going to come pretty quickly, yeah, like I mentioned, if you're if you're getting quality data. So anywhere from three to five, I was happy with seven and a half. Um, I've seen pictures with 15, even 20. I don't think it's justifiable in this case. I mean, if you really love the target, of course, go for it. Sink as much as you can. But if you're limited on time and clear skies like we have been lately, I think three to five hours will get you more than a, more than a good image and one that you'll be really happy with. So that, here's my single exposure. It's not crazy, you know, to be honest, I did expect to see a little bit more and even, even in a one minute exposure, um, but it's still recognizable and you can still clearly see it. So definitely, as I mentioned, easy to find and easy to recognize and to make adjustments accordingly. Now, I won't even bother showing my stacked image. It's just like all the other ones. It's pretty dark, so not a lot to see. But let's talk about processing, okay? This is a pretty easy target to process. Anytime you have a bright target, it's usually pretty easy. There's a couple little things that you might want to keep in mind. Now, this is called the Flaming Star Nebula. So if you go back to my first image there, you can see the star that they're talking about. It's, uh, it's the brightest one by far, the one that's likely emitting the, the light here and um, it can be a little bit tricky because the area all around it blows out uh, uh, fairly easily. It's quite a bit brighter than the rest of the target. So that's one thing to keep an eye when you're doing your stretching and your levels adjustments. Make sure you're not blowing out that area. That's the area to keep in mind, okay? So, so watch that as you, once you get to your fourth, fifth stretch, make sure you're not blowing out. If you're not happy with the rest of it, in other words, the rest of the target is not um, coming out like you want, but that, that area is starting to blow out, then what's the trick we do? We lasso it off the area, and then we select inverse in Photoshop, right? So when we do that, now we're protecting that area, and we're gonna very carefully stretch the rest of the image. Like, we don't go crazy, because it'll be you'll see it'll be very obvious where you made those adjustments, excluding that area. So just lightly stretch it some more, um, fix your levels adjustment, make sure it looks natural, then select the whole image, and you can continue on processing. So what I did in this case was I, I basically I um, lassoed off the entire thing, including this sort of smoke trail, and just sort of played with exposure, and just sort of pulled it out some some of the settings in Camera Raw Filter, 
just to make sure that it stood out nicely and very clearly, distinctly from the background. And then I selected inverse and I worked on the background a little bit. That also helps to make it pop. You can sort of lower exposure on the background. You can increase your darkness. You can increase your shadow. All those things to sort of make the, dark, the background darker. And that will also help to make your target pop out. So it's not all just about stretching your target and, and, and brightness and all that stuff. Adjusting the background will also make the nebula itself pop out more. And of course, while we're doing that, as I always mention, make sure that you're feathering. There's a box at the top when you last sue that says feather and it tells you to in input how many pixels. I suggest usually around 30 to 40 pixels. And that way you get a more, um, let's say natural uh, adjustments instead of leaving hard lines where you last sued it off. So once I was happy with that, what I did was I focused on the body itself. And now we're trying to bring out the details. We're trying to make those folds of gas, um, you know, give them some texture, really make them pop out, use the highlights to make, you know, sort of like on the California here where you see those bright spots. The, having a little bit of that, that is all what adds depth, right? And depth is so important to me. You want your images, you want to try at least to make your images have depth. So that's what I try to do. So I would, um, you know, highlight, I would, sorry, lasso off certain key areas. Uh, I'll show you here on my original image. And then I would select the entire image, make sure it looks natural, what I just did. If not, undo it, try again, maybe try a bigger area and just try to pull out, I just played with it over and over just to pull out as much detail as I could and still have it look natural, okay? Because you gotta remember every time you do stretching or you do even just like, um, what's the tab in camera ruffle, the clarity, all those, if you go too far with it, it can start to change the color and you can see exactly where you did it, even if you're feathering. So you gotta be really be careful. If all else fails, you can just select the whole body of the flaming star and work on it that way. And you'll be able to pull out a lot of detail and you know it'll really make your image pop and, and, and give it depth off that background. But other than that, there really wasn't that much. Now I also did, I did end up doing a starless version. Funny enough, it's called the flaming star and I removed the stars. I don't know, it's just one of these ones where there's just so much detail. I thought this might be a good a good uh, option for this particular target. I just, I don't know, I, I think I'm obsessed with these sky, with these starless images. I gotta, my next one won't be, I promise you that. But this was one of those ones where I really wanted to try it starless and I really ended up liking it. So I'm glad I did, but of course, you know, it's beautiful too with the stars in it. Um, and it is, as I mentioned, called the flaming star. So it probably makes a little more sense to leave them in there. But I ended up doing starless. It just really brought out the uh, the details nicely. And then when I did that, after I'd done that, I used, as I talked about, I think it was in my last video, I used the Topaz Denoise and it just cleaned up the background because when you do starless, um, you know, you see a lot, right? You're able to see any sort of graininess and all that there's not it's, there's no there's nothing there anymore to hide it so you got to really be careful with that so i used uh, topaz denoise that really helped i increased luminance a little bit just to sort of soften that background and then i just selected certain key areas and just sort of pulled them out increase just slightly increase exposure brightness just to make sure that all the the key areas of the target were popping off nicely from the back I also did a little bit more cropped version. You'll see both in the end of this video. I didn't, in this case, I know I always say when you do a cropped version, um, you should process it separately. So in other words, start over and, and focus in on that cropped area. But in this case, it wasn't that big a crop. I just basically cut out the flaming part of it and just focused on the main body. And all I did was literally just crop it more. And I think I liked that version even more, but I have both and uh, you'll see both of them at the end of this video. But that's really it, guys. It's a pretty easy target, I would say, overall. Um, even if you're just starting out, it's big, it's bright, it's easy to find, and it's not that hard to process. You don't need to go crazy. Sometimes less is more. And as long as you can get the background nice and consistent, and you can pull that nebula out a little bit, you'll have yourself a really nice image, and I think you'll be really happy with it. That's it for this one, guys. I hope that one helped. If you haven't had a chance, now is prime time for the Flaming Star Nebula. And as I mentioned, stay tuned for the next uh, Astrophotography Target Tips because not only will it be with its neighboring uh, nebula that I already mentioned, but it's gonna be my first full image using a new telescope and the new mount, no longer new. I've had a couple of videos on it already, but this time we're actually using it uh, three nights on this next image, so I'm compiling all the data and I'm 
preparing my review video. I want to use it a little bit more. I want to have a real educated, um, you know, video to be able to put forth to you guys. But um, so far, uh, I've worked out a lot of the kinks, as I mentioned in my last video, and I'm hoping to really do some serious work with this new mount. But the next video will feature a new telescope and that new mount. So I look forward to sharing that with you guys. In the meantime, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate your support. If you haven't already, please do subscribe. I'll have lots coming on that new equipment and of course, many more targets to come. So without further ado, here is the Flaming Star Nebula. Thanks so much and see you on the next one. Bye.